Justice, not ritual. Let's say that together. Justice, not ritual. Uh, Our text today is from Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. Let's read together. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not accept them, and the peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos. Today we are continuing to look at the justice of God by taking a brief look at the book of Amos. Now, Amos... Uh, name uh, means burden. So actually you want to make a note of that in your notes now, all right? And uh, burden. Let's say that together. Burden, burden. Say, I should have a burden. If I don't, something's not right. I should have a burden. (laughs) All right. Okay. What are you committing yourselves to? (laughs) Amos... um, came from humble rural roots. He was a country lad, all right? And uh, so Cornwall is rural, is it it not? Okay, so we can identify with Amos, can't we, Linda? Right, he lived in a village called Tekoa, which was six miles south of Bethlehem. Uh, He was a sheep farmer, and he also gathered the fruit of the sycamore tree, which is, uh, I suppose, a kind of fig, all right? He had no formal theological training, all right? It was just like you and me. Most of his prophetic ministry was carried out in northern Israel. I think it's worth noting this, that some say at least two years passed between the time he received his first vision from the Lord, which is... Uh, detailed in chapter 1 of of his book, and when he wrote it down. This they kind of extrapolate from verse 1. Why do I think that's worth noting? I think it's worth noting because just because God speaks to you doesn't mean that you need to tell people about it straight away. Sometimes we get so excited when God speaks, we think that we need to tell people straight away. And I often wonder, why is that? Why is it that we never say, very rare do we say, Lord, when do you want me to share this? Or Lord, do you want me, would you like me to share it? I think sometimes it, it feeds our flesh. God Almighty has spoken to me, right? And so we want to share what God has spoken to us, really, and it's about glorifying ourselves rather than glorifying the Lord. Because surely if it was about glorifying the Lord, we'd we'd say, I I believe God has said this to me. I need to weigh it. I need to test it with other people who are filled with the Spirit and full of wisdom. And then I need to ask, Lord, when do you want me to share it? Hmm? If it's about glorifying the Lord. But often I think, some, you know, if we're not careful, we can, it's about glorifying ourselves, making ourselves look good. We've heard from some of the people who are coming into partnership that they like be, they want to be part, part of being part, uh, part of this church is because of the honesty that, that, is, that is here. Um, can we be honest this morning? Yeah? And so here's this rural ch- man, he hears something and he waits a while before it is written, before it's delivered to others. He was living in a time of relative peace and prosperity in northern Israel and Judah. Things were going well. There was money. Th- there was good um, business. Relationships were okay. They weren't being threatened by any other nations around them. It was a time of peace 
and a time of prosperity. But what Amos saw was the negative results of peace and prosperity. Let me repeat that. What he saw, what he became aware of, what the, God the Father showed him was the negative results of peace and prosperity in the nation. And what were they? There was luxurious living for the rich. The rich were having a ball. Everything was going well. They were making money, charging exorbitant interest, doing great deals for themselves. And they were living in great luxury. Their houses were great. Their gardens were great. Their bank balance was great. And they were enjoying where they were at in life and things going well. There was exploitation of the poor. The poor were being exploited. The gap between the rich and the poor was increasing all the time. And, uh, and the, the poor were struggling to live, struggling to eat, struggling to smile, struggling to dance, struggling to share. How many of you know that uh, you need money to operate? You need money to, to, to buy food. You need money to buy drink. You need money to have shelter. You need money to have raiments, clothes. You need money, yes. And so if you don't have money, it's, it's difficult to smile. Is, is it not? It's difficult to have a sparkle in your eye, isn't it? Because you don't have what you need, let alone what you would you desire. And so the, the poor were being taken advantage. They were being exploited. They were being, they were being taken advantage of. Where? Who? By whom? The rich. So the rich were getting richer at the expense of the poor. Hmm. You're feeling it. Yeah. There were loose moral standards. Oh. A lot of misbehaving. A lot of immorality going on. God's moral law was not being adhered to. Lots of sleeping around. Adultery. Stealing, lying, cheating, <coughs> vows being broken, children being taken advantage of, women being taken advantage of. Loose moral standard. There was corruption in public life. We know a bit about that, don't we? You know... Corruption in the king's court. Corruption in the courts of the land. Corruption among the men, the supposedly wise businessmen of the, of the cities and of the village. Corruption in the local councils. Not dealing well with people. Not looking well, not looking after the populace in the way that they should do. Corruption. And religious observ observations based on ritual rather than real piety. In other words, they were singing their songs and they were bringing their sacrifices to God. But it wasn't about godliness. They were just doing, going through the motions. It was just words. It was just actions that had no power, had no substance, because their hearts were not in it. They were hypocritical. They said, we sacrifice this because we love God, and we sacrifice this because we love God, and we do this for God, and we, and we tithe and give our offerings to God because it's right, etc. But it was just ritualistic. It was, it was just religion. It had no power in it. There was no real love for God, no love for his ways, because if you love God, you'll love his ways. If you love God, you'll love his commandments. If you love God, you'll love his teachings. If you love God, you'll love his moral law. And if you can't keep his moral law, 
and you don't like his commandments and live the way you want to do and you don't believe in his, his and, and, and put your, you know, live according to his ways, then don't say you love God. You don't. You don't. But if you love him, you will do as he says. You will fight to do it. You may make mistakes. You may stumble. But you will fight to do it. Because you love him. You love him. You will seek desire to please him. You want to do things that will bring pleasure to his heart. Because you love him. And you know what to do, how, how we bring pleasure to one another's heart? By seeking not to upset one another. Not se seeking not to hurt one another. Seeking not to disappoint one another. Well, it's the same thing with God. He says, if you love me, obey me. Not what you just like, what you like, what you understand. He just he doesn't say, if you love me, obey me with what you like about what I say. Obey me with what you feel comfortable about, about according to my ways. Obey me with, with, with regarding the things that you, you understand. No, he didn't say that. He says, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, walk in your com commandments. He's saying, if you love me, just follow me, obey me, trust me, have faith in me, trust me. And faith kicks in. When you are struggling to understand what somebody wants. When you are struggling to get your head around it. When you don't know whether you agree with it or not. And you don't know whether you have the power to, to discipline yourself. To walk in line with what is request, requested. It's faith that kicks in then. Faith says, I trust you and I trust your ways. I trust you more than how I feel. I trust you more than my, un my, my finite understanding. I trust you more than the struggle and the pain that I feel. That's faith. And so God says, if you love me, trust me. Trust me. But they weren't. They were just doing outward things, trying to tick boxes, but there was no relationship. There was no love for God and there was no trust for God. These things were abusive and unjust as far as God was concerned. They were abusing God's people, they were abusing one another. And they were unjust in, in, in their behavior towards one another. So Amos is railing about this. He's, he, 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 you know, he's really wound up. He's just, it's just, we're unjust, God. We're so, and so much so that he go, he, he's attacking the establishment. And a powerful priest hears what Amos is saying because he's calling everybody to repent. And a powerful priest hears what he's saying. And, uh, and he goes to the king and he accuses Amos of sedition. I want to look at a verse which I find very interesting before we dive into our text. And it's Amos chapter 3, verse 6. And I don't think it's coming up on PowerPoint. But listen carefully. It says this. Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? They used to blow, one of the reasons why they blew trumpets in those days was as an alarm to call people to battle, to get ready. Because this, the, the town, the city, the nation was being attacked. So the, it, it, God says, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people not afraid. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? What's going on here? What is God saying? You see, in this verse, we're reading about the sovereignty of God. We're reading about the omniscience of God, you know, that God is all-knowing. And we're reading about the free will of God. 
And so what God is actually saying, then, God is, is warning this country through Amos and saying, you will bring destruction upon yourselves, even exile, if you do not exercise justice in your communities and right relationship with your Creator, and I will allow it as punishment. What we need to understand is that God is totally in control and that God is an eternal God. He, he views things through etern- to the eyes of eternity because he's an eternal God. And when we behave unjustly towards one another and we deal unjustly with God, then things begin to happen that are not comfortable, that they are are not right. And God allows those things, those negative consequences to occur, to discipline, to cause us to understand that we are going astray to cause us to understand that we are hurting one another and we need to stop, to cause us to understand that we are, we, we are offending God and, and we need to stop, to cause us to understand that we are destroying ourselves and that we need to stop and return to Him and His ways. And so God, God is saying, does, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? What does he mean? Are you saying that God brings upon evil, that God does evil? No, he does not take uh, joy in evil. He does not want anyone to die. He does not want anyone to perish. He does not want anyone to suffer. But what he says is this, that unless we do things the right way, we invite evil and we invite destruction and we invite exile upon ourselves. And because we have free will, he's, he allow, we, what we end up doing is choosing that. And God says, you have chosen this way and so this is what you're going to go through. Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 23, verse 15, says this. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. God is is saying... I'm in control here. And if you follow me, you will prosper. If you follow me, you will do well. God is saying, I don't need you. What is it to need? It's to be impoverished without. God says, I'm all sufficient. I don't need you, but I chose you. I don't need you, but I made you. I don't need you. But I called you and formed you into your mother's womb. And all I want to do is to bless you and cause you to prosper and cause you to do well. That's all I want. That's what it's about. And he says, this is the way. Follow me and you'll be blessed. But if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And when it says that, when it says this thing, where it says, "Does God come to a city unless does he, disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it?" What the scripture is, God is saying, "I'm in charge," and so if you know, it won't happen if you do what's right. It won't happen if you obey me. It won't happen if you follow me. Evil won't come upon you if you walk in the way that I've prescribed for you to walk. It won't happen because I'm for you. I'm in charge. I've got this. But I've given you free will. And I need you to choose me and my ways. That's what he's saying. Are you hearing that? All right.
it, let's go to a text. Our text has got some strong la- words in it, Andy. God says, I hate. Say that, I hate. Oh, I hate. I hate, I hate, I hate. He says, I despise. Say that, I despise. Hate and despise, strong words, aren't they? Strong words. What does he mean? He's saying, I, I despise. It means to spurn. It means, it means to want something to disappear. You know, not, not, not want to see it, not want it to be there anymore. It means to loathe, to refuse, to reject. What, what does God hate and what does he despise so strongly? I hate, I despise, I hate, I despise, I hate, I despise. These are the things. He says, I hate and I despise your feasts. What were the feasts? The first thing we need to understand is that the the feasts were religious feasts. They were feasts that God had told them to do. Feasts that God had given them to do. Feasts that came from heaven, from the heart of God. Where they were to get together numerous times in the year to eat and to drink and to laugh and to enjoy their community, and remember the goodness of God. It was feasts where they were to stop working and, and laboring so that they could rest and enjoy one another and give thanks together to God for what he had provided for them, which enabled them to have feast. Jesus was supposed to be in the center of their feasts. And yet, Jesus is saying, I hate and despise your feasts. What else did he say? I hate and despise your solemn assemblies. Every time you get together and you stand before me and the word of God is being read by the scribes, and the musicians, the Levites and priests are, are, play, are playing and the priests are doing the sacrifices, whatever, you know, etc. And you bring your fasting and, and all and, 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 you, and you can make these vows. I hate it. I despise it. What else does he say? He says, I hate and I despise your burnt offerings, your grain offerings and your peace offerings. These were offerings that they bought to you know animal sacrifice for animal sacrifices uh, to so 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 they could uh, appeal to god to for the, to have their sins forgiven god gave them those things he said if you approach me you need to have burnt offerings and you need to have this sort of offering and this sort of offering and you need to have grain offerings you know and so on you need to have these things to, as you approach me and if you do these things, I will, ex- I will accept you. And I will wink. I will oh, uh, um, um, you know, push your sins aside, as it were. And they had to do these things regularly when they did things wrong. And these things helped them to get right with God. And God is saying, I hate them. I despise it. And then he says this, take away the noise of your songs. Stop it. Stop singing. You're giving me a headache. You're hurting my heart. I don't care whether you're in tune or not. I don't care how great the percussion is. I don't care how many streamers are going. I don't care how much dancing is, do, is going on. Stop it. I don't care how good the lyrics are. You might be saying that you love me and, 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 you, and you love my ways, etc. Shut up. Stop it. And I will not listen anymore. I despise your song. I hate them.
You see, I have to ask the question, why has God got such a cob on? <laughs> why has he got such a at negative attitude to hate and despise the things that his beloved people are doing? Why? Such strong language. Such passion in those words. I hate, I despise. Why has he got such a, an attitude? Because they trample on the poor. Because they're trampling on the poor. They're doing all this so-called ritual, religious, Christian, which is Jewish stuff, but get with, follow me, stuff to draw near to God, but they're trampling on the poor. They're ignoring the beggar. They're in, ignoring the widow. They're ignoring the orphan. They're not bothered about if they're clothed. They're not bothered about if they've got food to eat. They're not even bothered if they've got shelter. They're looking down on them and thinking that they deserve the, the condition that they're in because they must have sinned or their parents have sinned or their grandparents have sinned and God is put punishing them. And they're thinking, we're all right, Jack. We've got it all together. We've got money. We've got this. We've got that. We've got, we're middle class. We're rich. We've we got homes. We've got, we got a nice family. We've got it all together. And then we go, we, we go to the temple and we do all, and we sing songs to God and we bring our sacrifices. We're all right, Jack. We're having a great time in our little world. It's okay with us. And they're ignoring those who it's not okay with. In fact, they're not ignoring them, they're trampling them. They're not giving them an opportunity to get up. They're not giving them an opportunity to get clothes. They're not giving them an opportunity to, and giving them a helping hand so that they can get shelter. They're not giving them a helping hand so that they can earn uh, some money to buy a crust. But they're trampling on them. And they're standing on them. And they're keeping them down. They hate people who reprove them regarding their actions. So if anybody criticizes them regarding how they're behaving, they hate them. If anybody says, don't, no, stop, don't do it this way, do it that way, stop, don't live this way, don't live that, stop, you're being selfish, stop, you're being self-indulgent, they hate them. They turn against them. They say, who are you to speak to me? Who are you to tell me what to do? Who do you think you are? They detest those who speak the truth to them. Isaiah 59, 15 says this, truth is lacking. Isaiah was a, a contemporary of Amos. He said, Isaiah says, truth is lacking. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord sees it and, is disple and it disple displeases him that there is no justice. For there to be justice, there has to be a love of the truth. We have to desire the truth. And here they are. The, the nation of Israel, they're detesting those who speak truth to them. They detest them. They hate them. The last thing they want to hear is truth. The last thing they want to hear is the truth of God. Ooh, does that make sense? Does that ring a bell? We live in a postmodern age. Post-truth age, last thing we want to hear is the truth because we've all got truth and my truth is as good as your truth and guess what? My truth allows me to be happy because it allows me to do whatever I want to do and I'm totally unaccountable to you and how dare you tell me that your truth is better than my truth. And so we're busy with all our truths, doing our own things, and so we, our society, our nation is breaking down. We're losing integration. We have no cohesion. And pain and loneliness is increasing. All because we don't want to be told what to do. 
They afflict the right. They're afflicting the righteous. Anybody who is doing good, anybody who is fighting for the oppressed, anyone who's speaking truth, anybody who's trying, anyone who's going against the grain, they afflicted them. Is that not happening today? God, you put your stand up and say, hang on a minute. The God's moral law says this. Oh, dear. You're going to be, you, you, they hate people, right? You know, I mean, you know, you could, could be taken to court. You know, you know, you can't speak the truth in, in school, God's truth in schools and in the council buildings and, and you know, in, 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 in leisure centers, in, you know, places where people gather in case people get offended. Everybody wants to be affirmed and stroked. You do it, you do it, every, you can't judge me, you can't judge me, you can't judge me. Who are you to judge me? Have you ever thought about that, why we re react to this? You know, when, when, when constructive criticism is given to somebody and they say, oh, you can't judge me? You know, what does that say? I think it says a number of things. It says that they're arrogant, but also it also says that, they've, that they know they need to be judged. <laughs> yeah? They know that things aren't right. Notice I'm using the word judge, not condemned. That's a different thing. Only God can condemn. But we have to appraise things. We have to judge what's right and what's wrong. We're called to do that. And perhaps people responding and saying, oh, you can't judge me, is because they're feeling pretty guilty anyway. Oh. They turn aside, they were turning aside the needy at the gates. What do you mean? Well, at the gates of a city is where the, the men of the grey-haired men sat. That's the court. And so you would go to the gates of a city in, the, in those days and, you would, uh, and you'd be able to speak to wise men, supposedly wise men, and they would judge and, uh, situations. If you brought problems to them, etc., they'd give you wisdom and so on. And, but here we're told that they turn aside the needy. So these people who should have been full of wisdom, should have been full of, in, uh, of, of uh, an understanding through the experience of life and their, and their pursuit of God, when needy people came to them for help, they would turn them away. They'd say, we ain't got time to talk to you. We ain't got time to share our experiences with you. We ain't got time to judge between you and this person who you feel has, has hurt you or robbed you or treating you unjustly. We haven't got time for you. We're too busy relaxing, too busy having fun, too busy enjoying ourselves. Oh, perhaps they also needed a bit of some money too. Well, if, they, if, 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 if you can just you know, give me some money, I can give you a judgment. Ooh. the people were loving evil they were calling evil good good evil darkness light light darkness bitter sweet sweet bitter they loved evil do you know there are some people out there in our nation that love evil they love evil Oh, well, it's just the way they were brought up. Oh, well, it was the way their parents were. Oh, they just don't understand. Oh, they're just victims of circ circumstance. Oh. For some, that's true. But not for everyone. There are people out there who choose evil. They choose it. They want it. They love it. And if you give them good, they don't want that. I know of a person, they love evil. They will rob people, uh, rob the people's stuff from their homes. They will go in and they'll rob. They were even known to take Christmas presents. From, of children from, other, from people's homes and take them. They don't care about who they give the, the ch children that they're selling drugs to. They laugh and celebrate 
when they've done their shoplifting and they take their shoplifting home and they sit there and they laugh and celebrate and think they've done a tremendous job because they've conned so many shop, you know, shop owners and, and the store detectives and they've, in other words, they've got away with it. And they laugh about it. They think it's brilliant. They think everybody else is stupid. They love evil. And there are people in, that na- in the nation of Israel that will love evil. They hate good. They hated good. Anything good stuck in their nostrils. Any good act. Any kind act. Any right way. They weren't interested. They hated it. And the wealthy were at ease. They were at ease. They were indifferent to the poor. Poor? What poor? I can't see him. Oh, I'm all right. I'm having a great time. Living in their own heads. They trampled on the needy. They desired the holidays of the nation, which were the feasts and the Sabbath, to end quickly. Why? So that trading could begin. So the poor would be made to work. So there was no rest for the animals. Everything was about money. So, oh God, we have to have a holiday. Oh, God's law says we have to have a holiday. We've got to have this feast. We've got to have the Sabbath. And they couldn't relax until the Sabbath and the feast were done with so that everybody could go back to work and start earning money for the wealthy again. That's abusive. And I've said it before. It was a crying shame. When the shops started opening on, the government said shops could open on a Sunday. That day that we had and that we honoured for a day of rest, a day when, when you know, farmers, Christian farmers, you know, would, wouldn't work their animals. They wouldn't work their machines. They wouldn't, they, they, everything stopped so people could rest. Families could be together. We could remember where, what life is about, where life came from, from God himself. It was a break on society. But there are those, you see, who are just thinking about the money. That's all they were doing. It was people in power thinking about the money. People who had money thinking about the money. The rich who had doing well life thinking about the money. And all they could see was a, a day which was where there was inactivity regarding work. And so they lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied. Until our government, thinking of votes, once again, said, all right, yes, shops can open from 10 to 4, or whatever. It's abusive. It's robbing us of rest. Amos 5, verse 24, says this. But let justice... Roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Justice for everyone. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. How will justice affect that which you're seeing on PowerPoint now? which is manifest in our society today, how will justice change those things? How will justice, what will our nation look like if we start pursuing justice? How will these things that were up on PowerPoint change? Let's have an interactive time now. The poor would have equal opportunity for success and... um like, yeah, just a, for equal opportunity. Equal opportunity <laughs> for success. Equal opportunity to make it in life. Whether they choose to or not is up to them. But one thing we can say is that we... Do they have the choice? We, have, we can question, is there a choice? Is there a choice? Is there equal opportunity? Crispin. 
I think the rich would actually look at the poor and think, that, what can I do for them? And have a conscience and have compassion. So, and, and because they've been given, they would have something to say, well, I've, I have much and I can share. Exactly. So the rich would have a sense of responsibility, yes? And say, right, I have been given much, so I, ha so I have a responsibility to give, to help others who have not. Marina. Change, change the taxation systems so that the loopholes which allow huge um, companies to pay no tax mm. are closed so that they pay what they should be paying so that the tax burden is more equally shared. Okay, yeah. And then Nigel Turner. After. I would like to say, you know, um, we all have different giftings and some people come on this world and they are brought up in the good education and others in rotten households where daddy or mom are drinking and where nobody is looking after the kids. And so um, I think we, uh, not everybody has the, uh, the same opportunity and it's, 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 it's a genetic, you know, the ability of the brain or the mentality okay. of the so people. So taking the fact that not, again, sensitive to people that, that struggle, um, that, you know, have not got the, the, the necessary um, ability that we, we would, um, that others have, making sure that we take care of them as well. And, um, uh, you know, uh, not just focusing on that which seems to have it all together, yes? Yeah, I find it unrighteous that somebody who has much, it's been given from God a good brain and can study and so much money and another person who okay. has little That's brain clear. doesn't get anything. That's it. You know, right. Okay, yeah. Seek to bring the balance, you know. We talk a lot about work-life balance at the moment, mm. um, but uh, we need those things to get that balance right. Yeah. We need to address those things to get that balance right because we're out of balance yeah. and we're tired. Yeah. We're worn down. Yeah. We're, we're, we're stressed mm. as, a, as a society. Mm. Um, but if we actually did things the right way, mm. uh, our work would be enjoyable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Very good. Yeah. When I was a child, yeah. we were brought up as others first, yourself last. Yes, yes. And you don't take the biggest piece of cake, you give to others first, and then you take after it. And I think the whole thing now is about me first. Yeah. Mm. What I want or how I want it and everything. Mm. And success. Yeah. Success is about money to a lot of people. Yeah. It's not about success helping others. Yeah. And you feel very successful and good if you actually help other people. Exactly. You know, and I think people have actually forgotten that in life. Exactly. We've got caught up with just the pursuit of bits of metal mm. and paper notes, yeah. and with the, which have a, s a slim thi <laughs> a thing of silver running through them, and yeah. um, and and you know the stuff that rusts and, and rots. Whereas you know we've forgotten about one another and uh, that, that people are true value, mm. and you know and s you know somebody's success is our honour. You know someone doing well in life is is, is our honour, and yeah. you know we've forgotten about that. You know serving. It, you know that to see people do well to 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 imp is empowering and equipping them. That's mm. real treasure. That's eternal. Yeah, we've you forgotten. You feel better about yourself. Mm. You, if you really feel down, you go out there and you help somebody yeah. and see how good you feel. Exactly. Total difference. Exactly. We've forgotten that. Yes. Uh, Claire. Oh, and, um, and Danny at the back. Yeah, great. Oh, just when I look at all these things, I'm just like, in God's justice, part of it is that people will be able to receive conviction and that repentance would be able to come mm. that's what well, and when I look at that mm. I think that's the only hope is that men's hearts would would you know conviction the Holy mm. Spirit mm. we need the Holy Spirit we're such it's such a mess that we need him Danny Danny next yeah and then to br we need the Holy Spirit to bring conviction yeah I think those people who are successful and are racing for the next big uh, money win they're not fulfilled, mm. so they're like striving all the time for the next thing, mm. um, but 
they're chasing something that they never get because yeah. they need So they want something. more, they're hungry for more, it's because yeah. they're not fulfilled. And again, it's because God has e been ejected out of society, isn't it? Because mm. God is the one who completes every human being. Yeah. Um, m your m money will not complete you, relationship will not complete you, it's only Jesus Christ that will complete you. Yeah? All right. Okay. I was going to say the same thing, really. That you're, they're always, um, if you've got lots of money, you're trying to satisfy it with um, more and more things, but you still don't feel satisfied, but you'd feel more satisfied helping the poor. Okay, good. So how, what, what, what are we saying here? This is what we learn from Amos. It, this. Amos and other prophets served as the moral conscience of their communities. Let me say that again. Amos and the other prophets served as the moral conscience of their communities, of their nation. So must we. That's God's charge to us. They were fearless critics of their rulers and so should we be. Fearless. And some of the things I'm hearing that, that, uh, uh, regarding the church in some of the, uh, in the media, it's like, goodness me, why are we kowtowing? <laughs> what are we doing? What are we, why are we giving way? We are God's people, God's children. We should be fearless. We must promote moral purity and social justice. To do this, we have to n have knowledge of contemporary events and grasp social and political issues. It's not you in your own little world. If you go into your own little world, and your own little world is this, me and Jesus and my blood family and one or two friends and the church that I attend, I wonder if God would say to you, I hate your songs. I despise your songs. I don't want to hear it anymore. I get nervous when I hear people say, you know, the news is so bad that I can't listen to the news. The news is so bad that I can't listen to what's going on there. The news is all left or the news is all right and so I just can't be bothered with it anymore. I've got, I've, I've got a fatigue. I've got compassion fatigue. I've got this sort of fatigue and that sort of fatigue, etc. I dare to say to you in the name of Jesus, with love and compassion, that if you are not engaged with what is going on in this world, if you are not aware of what is happening politically in our nation, if you are not aware what, what is happening regarding social issues in our communities, then you are in a very dangerous place as a child of God and I dare to say to you that God might say stop singing the songs you're singing because I can't hear it and I'm not listening anymore because you have isolated yourself from the pain and the confusion and the distress that is in your land and you're called to bring my hope to them so you need to know what they're going through. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he couldn't love us at a distance. He said, son, and the son said, yes. And they said, and so we need to put a plan together for, to save people from their sins, to save people from evil, to save people from destruction. And the plan is this, that you go and you give your life for them and, 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 and I raise you from the dead three days later and so that whoever puts their trust and confidence in you, they can have their sins forgiven and, and have abundant life, life everlasting. 
This is it. Will you go down, son? Will you go and walk amongst them? Will you become like them? Will you know their pain? Will you know their suffering? Will you know their so- sorrow? Will you touch them? Will, flesh, will you allow flesh to meet flesh? Will you go and be and be amongst them? Will you be fully God and yet fully human in their midst? Will you do that? Will you lay aside your glory in all eternity and go and walk amongst them? So that they know I love them. And I'll make a way for them if they turn to me. And yet you think that you don't need to listen to what's on the news. And you don't need to read the newspaper. And you don't need to listen to political shows. That's not the heart of God. God wants you to know these the people. He wants you to know what your people are going through. He wants to speak to you and give you opportunities to get into places where you can bring hope. You can bring the morality of God, the justice of God, and the ways of God. He does not want you to be uneducated about what is going on in our nation. He wants you to be educated His knowledge, his power. You must have knowledge. You must have understanding. John Stott said this. He said, we need to have one ear on God and then the other ear on what's happening around us. We need to be aware if we are going to bring hope to people. We must be like Amos, the rural prophet. We live in a prophetic area. And I wonder if God, um, a rural area, and I wonder if God is saying, church, be like Amos. He was like us. We're not living in a city where there's loads of money and there's lots of opportunities. We're living at the end of the nation. We're living in a rural setting. And God is saying to his church, be prophetic. We are the local expression of a prophetic company. God, the church is a prophetic company. We are part of the church of Jesus Christ. And we need, we're called to be Amos's and Isaiah's and Hosea's. People standing up and saying, we must have the justice of God. Justice, guys, not ritual. Justice, not religion. And because they strayed away from it, God says, I don't want to hear your songs. and I don't want to hear your sacrifices. I'm not interested. We don't want God to say that to us, do we? Surely not. Surely not. Then God says, take my good news to the poor to the broken, to the struggling. Know where they are and let me bless them through you so that justice will flow in this land that we love so much. (coughs) Amen. Amen. Come on. If we don't do it, there is no hope. It's down to us. It's down to the church of Jesus Christ.